Hello, hello. I hope this is working. Can everyone hear me? Great. Welcome. Thanks for joining. Um, we're here this afternoon to talk about inclusive spaces, new ways to design how we live and work. Um, sorry about that. So, um, spaces are designed to reflect both the purpose of the space and the needs of its users. Um, that means at work, while traveling, at home, at play, the space has to be fit for not just the purpose, but also for the people. That's what we mean by inclusive design. Um, I, I think this space is a really great case in point. I mean, we have these great um, large meeting halls and small meeting halls. We have spaces to network. We have, uh, we have this great energy in this room, and I think the space just helps create energy itself the way it is, and that's, that's why we have to wear these headsets, because there's so much energy in the room. What, what do you guys think? I mean, is this a, a really awesome space for, for this event? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. Great. Um, I, uh, I personally have one quibble with this event for the Women's Forum, but I'm not going to share it with you right now, <laughs> because this isn't about me. This is about my panelists here. So let me introduce them uh, very quickly here. Uh, first to my left is Maud Bailly, the Chief Digital Officer of Accor. She has a lot of fans. <laughs> um, next is Alain Krakowicz, General Manager of SNCF champs -Elian. Then we have Florence Noiset, partner at Wavestone. And lastly, Raphael Gilgen, Head of Research and Trend Scouting at Vitra. I, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Larry Yu. Yeah, all right, all right, that's it. <laughs> um, I'm just going to start with, uh, with having a conversation with, uh, with each of our panelists and, um, uh, about inclusive spaces and about transformation and, and connecting spaces with how we live, work, travel. Uh, play and everything else in our lives. Um, so let's start with Maud. Uh, let's talk about your own workplace. Uh, how are new ways of working affecting the design of your workspaces? Well, um, actually, uh, we have a new headquarter since uh, 2016 for our hotels, which is in Isil e Molino, and it's a huge tower called Sequana. So we have uh, indeed, uh, Larry, new workspaces which are supposed to be inclusive spaces. So everything in the headquarter is organized around open spaces for everyone on each floor, okay? You've got uh, window, meeting rooms, and on each floor, on the, uh, you've got each corner on each floor, a wide uh, table uh, on which you can sit, share coffee, talk. So we are supposed to have indeed inclusive spaces. Still, my point I want to share with you today is that uh, new workspaces is a first good step, but it's not enough. You can perfectly sit close to someone you don't know anything about. And even if you share we, the we same... We just met. <laughs> no, it's not true. Uh, even if, I mean, you are working, in fact, in the same workspace, you may not necessarily work better with the person because you are sitting close to the person. Just the same way you might have no idea of the people you are taking the elevator with every morning. So my purpose is to say, yes, we do have new workspaces in Accor Hotel. Yes, those are open spaces and inclusive spaces. But my conviction is that we as managers have the responsibility to empower those new workspaces with inclusive methods. So my responsibility as a manager is to take these great assets, new workspaces, with new methods, so i.e. feature teams, breaking the silos and helping the people around the product to work better today together. MVP, minimal viable product. Please stop trying to launch a product and to bet on the delivery process in three years, eight months, and 47 days. Let's be more in a test and learn mode, in a sprint of uh, 90 days, 
allow the people to have the right to fail and to work together differently. So those new space can allow people to work differently, but you have to push the power of those working spaces with new methods. And finally, you can also launch new methods like visual management, because you know in your everyday life that people are focused on their business. So we need to create transversality. And those new workspaces allow us to input those new managerial methods. This is it. Great. Uh, I mean, you've you're talked about bringing together people who haven't worked together uh, before. Um, does that mean your workspace needs to accommodate diversity in new ways? And, and how does that reflect you know, the changing culture in your organization? Uh, actually, in Aqua Hotel, we are going through a huge transformation. I think you must know that under the leadership of Sébastien Bazin. Uh, I'd like to share with you two things. Uh, integration of diversity <laughs> and uh, co-design necessity. Why integration of diversity? Because uh, for the past years, Aqua Hotel, which is a traditional hospitality company around mid-scale and eco-brands, has dramatically, uh, dramatically changed. Why? Because we have just acquired new brands a whole lux luxury segment, FRS, Fairmont Waffles and Swiss Hotel. We have also acquired or developed new brands like 25 Hours, Mama Shelter, Joe Joe for Millennials. So we have dramatically enriched the portfolio of our brands. And so we, have, we are going through a huge cultural transformation. So this requires from us, not only about our workspaces, but also in our new ways of working, a capacity to integrate diversity. Those new businesses are also new people, new talents you learn to work with. We are also working with startups, as you know, and we are also intending and working with innovative structures like the camp or great school like the Innovation Lab, the West Coast Factory, with people who are 21 years old and explain you that uh, they have huge expectations about digital uh, habits and you should you'd better be able to catch up the market so my first challenge is to be able to manage with this integration of diversity and all the people and the talents which are who are beyond those new businesses second is about being able to co-design and this is another challenge for us why because our hotel is going through another cultural transformation we are about to switch into an asset light mode. We are, going ab we are about to sell our walls, as you may know. So more than ever, I have to tell my people that they have to be able to prove we in Aqua Hotel have to be chosen, to be chosen by our customers as well as by the hotels. So co-design is also a new way of working because you put all the people together and the question is, what do people need? What do they want? Are we really meeting the expectations of the market? And this co-design new way of working is also a little cultural revolution. Interesting, okay. Um, switching gears a little bit, hotels tend to cater to tourists and so they sit apart from the, the neighborhoods that they sit in. Um, can you tell me how Accor uh, plans to become more a part of its community, more inclusive of the community that it sits in? Uh, another transformation I really like in Aqua Hotel is the fact that we are trying to turn our hotels into life companions. What well, is an hotel as a life companion? Usually our traditional hotels are of course seen as dedicated properties or mainly dedicated to travelers who are not living in the city. Now we are about to launch a project called Aqua Local and Accor Local is quite clear and simple. Since we have thousands of hotels open 27 hours a day, uh, with great people specialized in client service, we want to be able, we in the heart of the city, to deliver everyday life services to the customers, meaning the neighbors of the hotel. So we are completely changing the perception of the hotel since it's going to be able to deliver a large range of services like flowers delivery for your wedding anniversary. You can also offer flowers, ladies. Putting fuel in the cars, collecting chronopost of FedEx parcels, uh, printing tickets, any kind of new services which, which can allow our customers to make their life easier. 
And I don't care if those new customers, Larry, don't even spend one night in my hotel. What I want to make to be what I want to be sure about is that we in the hotel are creating a new community, inclusive community, around the neighborhood of the of the hotels, which means we can also offer access for the neighbors of the infrastructure of the hotel, spa, fitness services, food and beverage, and for 27 uh, hours a day for the people who need it. So it's also a new way of considering hotel at the very heart of the city. Great, thank you. Let's move on to uh, Elaine. Um, I, I live in Boston where the trains do not run on time, so um, as far as I'm concerned... Sorry, sorry. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you make the, runs, uh, the trains run on time already, uh, so I want to hear about what's next. You know, how can new innovations best address the changing needs of urban residents and, uh, and users of transport systems? We, we all know that um, New, te new technology is uh, amazing and we can do uh, amazing things with it. And let me just give you an example. We know that in a few years' time, we'll be able to run automotive cars in, why not, robot taxi fleet. And that will change the city life. You must all know that a car, a private car today, um, is parked. 80% of its, of its time. There are 5% of its time where it's just looking for a parking place. So uh, a car is really driven 15% of its time. So if you've got automotive cars, you're going to be able to divide the number of cars you need dramatically. And what does it mean? Automotive cars are not going to get parked. They don't need to get parked, so you, you'll be able to get no more par parking place in a city. So you could ask me, why am I, Alain, a guy from SNCF train, uh, talking to you about taxis? It's just that uh, automotive cars and, and robot taxi fleet uh, might be a great way to run the last mile and the first mile, which are always the most difficult uh, parts of our journeys. Uh, and our responsibility is to coordinate all the transport, uh, the last mile, but also the, the main part of the transport, which will be, I'm pretty sure of that, always done by train, because trains are the only way to uh, transport 3,000 people every three minutes. But they need coordination between those parts of the journey. And so we'll have to uh, create new applications, new, uh, new uh, platforms to coordinate that. And, and we'll need uh, artificial intelligence to uh, be more uh, anticipating for our customers. And uh, we'll need, for example, NFC, near field contact, so that uh, our customers can use their, uh, their phone to get into the train to buy the tickets and we will be able to suppress the small ticket, uh, paper ticket uh, we all have in our, uh, in our pockets. Interesting, cool. Um, you know, transport has to reflect the needs of, of its users and, and different users have different needs. So what opportunities are there to, to include a wider group of people uh, including women, into the innovation process and, and uh, innovation results? Like any company, uh, SNCF has to be uh, uh, on the same uh, way as uh, its uh, customers. And um, we all know that we have uh, in our trains 50% of women in our trains. So I'm pretty sure we need women experts to design trains, to design stations, to design our new services. Um, my board of director is already uh, half uh, of, of, uh, uh, of women. So I've got already uh, half women for, for my uh, board of directors, but it's not enough. We need uh, women engineers. Uh, and uh, let me give you just an example. Um, when, you, when you're in a train, you've got a handles bar. You know, and often the handlebars are too high 
for women. And I guess they've been designed by many engineers. So we've got to change that. Um, and just to give you another, another example, um, we want to improve the passenger experience. And what we tend to do in France and in SNCF is to forbid, to implement new rules saying, you don't have to do that, you can't do that, it's forbidden. And it's necessary, obviously. But you can't just do that all, all the time. And we are pretty sure now that there are new ways of uh, changing the environment to be able to improve behaviors. And that's what we call uh, the neuroscience and the nudge, the nudge neuroscience. I don't know if you're familiar with nudge, but maybe uh, later I'll be, I'll be uh, able to speak a, more, a bit more about nudge. Sure, of course. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of behavioral economics. I, I like to study it. Um, I mean, you talked about the, the transport experience. Can you tell us more about what you're doing to improve, improve the experience, uh, particularly on the safety side of things? Yeah, safety has always been a major issue for, uh, for SNCF, um, and especially now. And uh, it's vital for all our customers. And it's, we are specifically keen to the, uh, our women customers for the uh, safety issue. So uh, let me just give you a few examples of what we've done uh, on the safety side. We've uh, implemented in the Paris region new trains, what we call uh, BOA trains, which, which means that uh, they're open, open trains without any partitions. And that uh, allows to have more space, a feeling of more, more safety. Uh, Another, another example um, is smart video. We are testing smart video uh, in two stations, Saint-Denis and the Bibliothèque François Mitterrand. And in those stations, with the smart video, which allows us facial uh, recognition, or uh, it allows us to, uh, to detect if there are uh, abnormal uh, movements in a crowd, uh, that's a, a huge improvement of, of the safety and, and, and an automated one. And uh, another example is our uh, 3117 uh, application and hotline, which uh, is now, uh, which was only on one line of Transilia, and it's now all, all over the Paris region and even all over the France, uh, all over France. And uh, this number is uh, uh, all witnesses uh, of victims of aggressions to call uh, to call for uh, staff which are specifically trained to uh, answer the problem and, 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 and the aggression and and, and now uh, specifically for the, the women aggressions yeah that's so important uh, thank you thank you for that let's move to Florence um, your work touches on the transformation of workspaces. Um, why do workspaces need to be transformed? Tell us. Yeah, okay. Um, first of all, let me introduce me because uh, Wavestone is probably not as known as SNCF or ACAR. Uh, Wavestone is a consultancy firm. Um, we are uh, 2,600 consultants of four continents. And uh, our job is to accompany our clients in their transformations. So I personally lead our workplace offer, which aims at transforming uh, workplaces, uh, work spaces, and digital workplace. And I think both are a very, very good lever for internal transformation. And it's not the only one Maud explained it before very well, but it's a good lever for transformation because uh, it helps, in, it enables new ways of working, enhances uh, employee experience, and uh, I'm very enthusiastic about this both lever. So um, let me ask a question to the audience. How many of you uh, now work in work, work uh, at offices with uh, workspaces that have been recently renewed, uh, where you feel enabled for innovation, for creativity, for collaboration? Please raise your hands. It's quite a lot, right? Because you are 
you are at the very heart of transformation, but uh, I think you all working on campus and you are very conscious that it's not the case everywhere, far from being the case everywhere. So um, there are too many drivers that lead us to uh, this transformation. For sure, there are classical real estate projects, but that's not the point today. The point is, um, for my first driver, I will use, uh, to illustrate the first driver, I will use a study provided by Dell. This study says that among young people between 18 and 34 uh, years old, um, these young people declare that 82% uh, of these young people declare that uh, the workplaces are a key criteria for choosing a job. And even more, 42% of these young people declare that they would quit, uh, they would leave this job if uh, uh, the workplaces in general were not as smart as they expect. So you see that there is a huge uh, stake of image embodying the image, uh, retaining, attracting these young talents and uh, um, attracting them because they are much more attracted for currently uh, to startups model than to large some kind of heavy uh, uh, traditional accounts that we all uh, have. Um, my second driver uh, would be a question of embodying uh, the um, values of the digital era. And Maud uh, talked very well about that before. Um, why are workspaces for me such a good lever of transformation? It's because you have the message con constantly under your eyes. It's surrounding you at work when you go in different workspaces. And it's also a good lever. So from these workspaces, you have all examples uh, directly at work. You have examples everywhere on the web, on Apple, Google, Facebook, very uh, uh, disruptive uh, uh, layouts uh, um, uh, for workspaces. But um, there are also much more traditional uh, um, uh, industries that are transforming. And I would like just to highlight a very, very nice project, which is Société Générale's one. Uh, I don't know if you know this project, it's called Les Dunes, and have a look on the web on, on this. It's a real experience of success, of transformation that combines deeply uh, a new experience in the workspace and new ways of working, and that really stimulates uh, the creativity and innovation mindset. So um, I, I love this project, if you know, there are people from Société Générale in the room. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, uh, you mentioned how transformations are essential to bring the, the new generation in, a younger generation in. I mean, tell us how, how transformations also uh, help drive um, inclusivity in the workplace uh, you know, in other kinds of ways, however you might define inclusivity. Okay. Um, there are really uh, two different kind of workspaces, uh, of uh, two different scopes in the workspace. Uh, there is a scope inside the workspace and around outside. So inside the workspace, um, it's definitely not a question of gender, because it's the subject of the day. It might be a question of generation, but the most uh, principal question is the question about the way people work and the job they're co going to do. It's not the question of copy-paste some of uh, glossy, dreamy uh, offices, but to build uh, with your employees uh, the workspaces that really fit their needs, their expectation, and the transformation you want to drive. So um, perhaps I can go a bit further about that. Uh, if you speak of around the workplace, it's interesting to... Uh, so in the first one, for sure, you have an inclusive approach, but not about gender. Uh, around the workplace, is it's interesting to think about the needs of women uh, and to have a specific look about that. Uh, it can avoid quite stupid mistakes like uh, uh, forgetting to have uh, near parking places for pregnant women or, uh, forget, uh, or avoiding to have holes everywhere in your pavement. And it can look like a joke, but women who work every day in La Défense, like me, that every day get stuck with their high heel shoes, uh, can, uh, 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 can find that uh, this La Défense has definitely not been thought for women. 
and you're right. <laughs> you, <laughs> you agree with me. So um, you can also have question of uh, safety uh, uh, around the location of your offices, and it joins what Alain said about the safety is in the transport uh, sector. Um, so uh, it, it's interesting in this case to have a look at uh, the women's need. And I like the sentence that says that uh, if you want women to break the glass ceiling, which is a very common phrase, you also uh, need to break uh, the floor that isolates men from their private life. And so uh, when at uh, work you think about services to offer to families, to parents, you also help uh, women's need directly or indirectly. Great, thank you. That was, that was interesting. Um, let's move to Raphael. Um, you also work in the transformation of spaces. Uh, can, you, can you tell us some of the innovative approaches that you've seen in, in the design of spaces? Yeah, for sure. So uh, one experience I want to share with you, it's quite easy. You all are familiar with Airbnb, and they have their headquarters in San Francisco, and they have no architects team. They're named environment team, and it's super cool what they're doing. So the environment team, they look at the listings of the best spots from the Airbnb places around the world. If it is a tiny house, a cabin, a castle, a boat, a flat, whatever. What they do the next step is they build up this um, uh, listing as a model in 1 to 10 or 1 to 20 to really deep understand what is the characteristic of the space and how this space is so attractive that so many people want to go there or spend their holiday there. And the next step, they provide this information to their teams and help them to build up their own workspace. How great is that? So and if you go through the uh, space at the headquarters in San Francisco, for sure it is an office, but it's like a journey into the world. You go from Paris to Cologne, from Cologne you go to Austria. But it's not banal, it is real vivid. It takes all generations and all genders with you. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, looking further forward, from the innovations that you're seeing today, you know, what does the organization of tomorrow look like and how does that inform design? Oh yeah, this super question. We do a survey with the Future City Lab in Singapore about the organization of tomorrow. Because you have to understand, Singapore will double the residents from six to 12 million because they have a huge old harbor. It's still the biggest harbor in the world, number three, Tango Paga. And we want to look, so what could be the city district of tomorrow? And for that reason, we also take a look in the buildings of the Fortune, Fortune uh, 500 companies. And believe me, that was real disappointed because the, the code is quite easy. The old buildings was built for separation first, not for collaboration. The old buildings is they are provide a process and not a relationship. And the last step, they are built to sign functions but not qualities. If you go to the new ones, you see they are not built for hierarchy anymore, they're built for collaboration. They provide not a process, they provide to come in better relationships with your coworkers. And the last term is a right quality space. And I believe these three patterns are the pattern of tomorrow. Thank you. Um, so I, I think I'd like to open it up a little bit to a conversation and, and, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with a very broad open question related to the theme of the conference, which is Dare to Lead. So we've talked about transformation, we've talked about change, we're talking about uh, innovation and, and how tomorrow looks very different. H how are you going to dare to lead to, to bring that to happen? Anybody? Anybody? Um, <clears throat> this is a huge question, Larry. Um, I would say um, talents. Talents, because we as manager have the responsibility to identify, retain, and attract talents. And amongst women, there's a punch of talents. So, um, so um, you know, we in our huge organization, and I guess we have four of us, big organizations, we have a lot of layers and huge organization, worldwide organization. And in those organizations, daring to lead to me is to have no fear, to launch new methods, to say, hey, let's try and let's fail. Anyway, everything is accelerating so much that if we fail, no matter, in three months, no one will remember that. And at least we would have 
got the right to fail and to test, and you want to test, this is the best way to succeed. So daring to lead is breaking the fear, breaking the layers, identifying talents who have no idea of the fact they are talents. And I'm not speaking about my N minus one or two, I'm speaking about N minus, I don't care, just bright people, and especially women who have this little seed of magic. And so daring to lead is allowing ourselves in our ways of working to mixing those people. I want to break silos and I want also to break the layers of our very vertical traditional organization. And you know we're talking about workspaces? Yeah, sexy, fancy workspaces are good to attract and retain millennials because those are talents. But our first responsibility to dare to lead is to identify our talents, all of talents, especially women, push them in new ways of working, meetings when I can talk to them, I can share with them, I don't care about their current position, provided they are bringing something. And what Sebastian Bazin has been doing with the Shadow Comex, you know, people under 35, we also are telling them there, there because I'm sure you can, and you know what, in many years you're going to be at my, in my shoes, and you're going to be even a better do be a, even a better job. So we trust you. There is kindness, a lot of kindness, and this is a quite a new way to lead people. And I'm very happy to tell you that for the second edition, half of the Shadow Comics has women. Congratulations. Uh, do you guys agree that uh, talent, uh, particularly the rising generation, is is critical? Yes, Mo, Mo, Mo talked um, about talent, so I couldn't say better. Uh, uh, um, I've, I've said that my board of directors are, are of women, so, uh, and, and we also have a Shadow Comics, and, and I'm pretty sure it's very, very useful. So you, you talked about uh, talents. I, I like to talk about spaces uh, and what we could do uh, to, to change, uh, to change a, a, a few rules. We've got a, a big problem in SNCF, it's that we've got stations, for example, that are more than 100 years old. And even trains, they are a lot younger. But still, uh, we sometimes have the feeling that we can't change anything. And uh, I would like to be able to implement the idea that we can change. We can change even things that are so old or so expensive. And l just to give you an example, we've launched in SNCF what we call uh, we could call uh, live experimentations. In fact, we uh, walk women through stations, through st through trains, and we ask them, uh, "Do you feel safe, or do you feel unsafe?" And with that information, we are able to just change the lights, the spaces, uh, the layout of the station with uh, just a few few works. Uh, so we've been doing that for a few years now, and it, it's very effective. But I would like to go a, a bit further. Uh, and and I, I talked before about nudge, nudge, which is a way, a neuroscience way to change the environment to change the, the behaviors. And I would like to be able to uh, implement nudges for women's safety. So that uh, in changing the environment, we can change behaviors without having to just set new rules, which are not always very effective. Thank you. Um, we, are, we are short on time, but I want to give you an opportunity to comment as well, if, if, uh, if you guys have comment. Uh, yes, for sure. Um, I think no industry is uh, no more immune from digital transformation. And it seems very simple to say that. But in fact, we have to deeply reinvent ourselves, reinvent the way we work, reinvent the way we think, we invent the way we design everything. And for the design of workspaces, there is a very basic and uh, um, a simple method, which is uh, the voice of employees and listening to the employees' the job they are doing and uh, the values they want to bring in uh, the company and to make this job collectively. It seems very basic, but in fact it's quite disruptive because workspaces used to be a, a real estate st stuff with logistics and with many IT constraints and so on. And it's now a corporate project. So um, workspaces 
are a, a, an illustration of the way we have to work, but in fact, we have to reinvent everything and bring uh, more employee engagement and bring more innovation at every level of the company and break the silos and everything. So um, what I, uh, I could share is um, what I say every day to my teams, just feel a load to reinvent everything because tomorrow will be the way, uh, the work that we have tomorrow will be the way we want collectively to be. So um, what I would say is just um, uh, authorize, uh, promote corporate hacking with it within your teams, let your teams reinvent the way they, they want to work tomorrow and you will have so much surprises. Uh, about that. So there to lead is also there to try and to act uh, to, towards success. And I want to add something finally also in the topic. Last week I was in Tokyo and you have, who of you was in Japan who knows the culture is different, they don't understand you because you're talking English and they're so really super straight. And uh, one of our customers is Yahoo. They have a high-rise building in Japan. And they have all the atriums. Maybe you company have these atriums, these alien atriums. Nothing is inside, a little bit art. A lady sitting at a reception desk in this empty space. And what they have done, they've broken it up. They provide this space to the community. They make a co-working space. And believe me, a co-working space in Japan is not normal. And you know what happens after three weeks? Five to 600 people every day take a ticket and go upstairs. What happens also, the Yahoo people sitting in their super floors are curious going downstairs and mix up with the company, with the co-workers. And there's a great book from Alex Pentland. It's called Social Physics about the power of collaboration. Inside your company, I don't believe you can enable your potential much more because you know your co-workers. You have to go outside. So if you bring the community from outside into your office, during lunch, during a session, you meet someone, that's a real exploration for yourself. Thank you, that's awesome. Uh, I think we're out of time, so the audience anticipated the fact that I was going to close. <laughs> Thank you for coming, everybody.